Well, I'm currently on the keto diet as well. So I am incredibly interested to understand A, like what's going on in my body, but B, I, I'm quite compelled by both the pros and cons of doing it. And I mm -hmm. want to talk about the cons and the pros mm -hmm. um, because they both exist. One thing you say in your book, Why We Get Sick, is that the longest living humans are also the most insulin sensitive. Yeah. So you're telling me that the longest living humans are the ones that are able to stave off that insulin resistance. Yes. Yes. So like there keep, are. Keep their insulin levels lower. That's right. Yeah. In fact, most of the longevity research, a sort of a final point on this, um, is that when you look at these studies that look back in time and say, okay, what is it about these people? What variables tend to go along with the longest lived humans? One of them is that they're insulin sensitive and their blood glucose levels are, in fact, a very well done study just last year out of Sweden. I think it was just one year ago. They looked at all, and Sweden is meticulous in its, in its record keeping, which is an advantage. In, in a, a fairly homogenous society, so it kind of eliminates some confounding variables. But they attempted to document what, are the, what were the variables that were just the most consistent theme of people who lived very long. One of them was good glucose control. And this next one is very controversial because they found that they also, the longest lived people had high cholesterol levels. And isn't that funny? It is one of the most consistent themes of longevity research that the longest lived people have higher cholesterol. And yet we live in a world that hates cholesterol. And the moment cholesterol goes up, we put them on a cholesterol lowering medication. We could be doing the perfectly wrong thing to help these people live longer. So that was, and, and then low uric acid, and there's a handful of other little variables that fit into this. Sorry, the, they found that some of the longest living humans had high cl yeah. cholesterol levels. Yeah, that's right. That's what the Sweden study found, for example. The paper just published a year or so ago, what were some of the most consistent themes? They had good glucose control and high cholesterol. I'm a great defender of, of cholesterol. It is a molecule of life. And it's so many, so much depends on it. Mitochondria, for example, mitochondria have to have a cholesterol molecule in them in order to work, like the very powerhouse of the cell. And the more you lower cholesterol through, say, drug interventions, the more you compromise the mitochondria. Um, the sex hormones, all sex hormones are built on cholesterol. It's no surprise if someone takes a cholesterol-lowering medication, their sex hormones go down. This is why some men experience such terrible loss of libido because he's becoming low testosterone because of the war on cholesterol. But there's good and bad cholesterol, right? Well, that's, as the story goes, yes. And yet I think that's overly simplified um, where people will say LDL cholesterol is the bad cholesterol. And yet that gets included in these studies of longevity. So I, I think the good and bad aspect of it is not entirely fair or accurate. We need LDL. And LDL is just as much a component of the immune system LDL actually helps the body fight infections. So it's also an unsung hero of immunity. There is research suggesting that in very old age, high cholesterol levels do not always correlate with higher mortality. And in some studies may even be linked to longer life. Exactly. Which is bizarre. Yeah, well, you say that, and yet maybe our anti-cholesterol view is the bizarre one. Yeah. And so as a cynic who's very familiar with biomedical research, I sometimes will look at clinical markers and say, why are we so obsessed with glucose? Why not insulin? Why are we so obsessed with cholesterol? Why not triglycerides, which is another lipid that can be measured that is far more predictive of who's going to have a heart attack or not. And I think it's because we have chosen markers in modern medicine that we have well-designed drugs. So it's a really, really good way to sell a lot of drugs. So there's no drug that's going to address insulin. So let's not measure it. But there are lots of drugs that will lower glucose. So let's measure glucose because then we can diagnose the problem and then we can give them a drug and make a lot of money. That's a cynical view, but I don't think it's unjustified. Similarly with cholesterol. Why look at LDL when triglycerides, another lipid marker, are a much better indicator? It's because we don't have a drug that effectively lowers triglycerides. You can with diet but we do have drugs that very effectively lower LDL. One thing that really surprised me when I was reading your work is there was a study done in Bulgaria which proved that smoking causes insulin resistance in humans by having seven healthy non-smokers smoke four cigarettes over an hour for three days. What did they find in that study? Yeah, so they found that if you took healthy, non-smoking people and had them start smoking, they became insulin resistant. I believe I invoked that study in the section where I was talking about inflammation, um, where 
when you cigarette smoke that elicits, there's a lot of junk coming in and there's a powerful inflammatory response and that contributes to insulin resistance. Is this vaping as well? Oh, so that is a very good question. I have in fact published now multiple papers with a very good friend and colleague who is a lung expert at my university, a guy by the name of Paul Reynolds. Paul and I, we have published reports together looking at cigarette smoking and the inflammatory and insulin resistance effects that come from that. And now we've even started looking at the molecules, the hyperheated molecules from vaping, and they're, they're terrible. In fact, yes, very similar results. If you were to take a comparable amount of the chemicals from normal cigarette smoke with its filter versus vaping, the vaping ones are probably worse, chemical for chemical. Oh, that's a great question. It doesn't because it replaces other interests. So if the cigarette smoker ate the way everyone else was eating, it would. But because the cigarette smoke satisfies a craving, they have less of an interest in food. What's so interesting about cigarette smoking is, again, as I said, you begin to smoke, other things don't tempt you as much, like the cookies and the cakes. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways the smoker helps kick the habit of cigarette smoking is actually eating candy. Like they will literally start carrying around little candies in their pocket. So if they feel a craving for cigarette smoking, they will take out a little candy, open it up and pop it in their mouth. And so it's no surprise that very commonly when a person quits smoking, they gain significant weight. They end up trading out their addictions, if you will. Um, and unfortunately in humans, all of the study of addictions with food, people only manifest an addiction to one type of food and that is carbohydrate. There's no evidence of addiction to fats or proteins.